Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Vu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into graduate school. For the past 10 years, I've been helping undergraduate students get into top graduate programs in their field, and I'm really excited to share this information with you too. Hi everyone, happy Sunday. Um, this Sunday is actually not as happy for me because I am doing a re-recording. Somehow I started recording and usually what I do is I'll test the mic first and then hear it to make sure that the voice sounds okay and then I start my recording. But this time I made the big mistake of just recording right then and there without testing the mic. I assumed this, you know, I didn't change any of the settings, so I assumed everything was good. I did a full 30 minute recording and then I went back um, to do the editing to publish this episode. And to my dread, I realized that things didn't quite sound the way that I wanted them to sound. Um, everything was super static and you could hardly hear my voice. There was no way to edit that out. And so now, as a result, I am re-recording, and in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the episode is is going to focus on today, and then I'm going to take a break in between just to make sure that my sound is fine, and then I'll keep going. All right, so today is, is uh, an episode on thriving as a low-income first-gen or underrepresented student in grad school. This is similar to the conversation that I was having last week about self-care and stress management. Some of the conversation, it, it overlaps in some way. I'll try not to overlap too much. Um, but I wanted to say that this topic is motivated by an event that I've co-organized for two years now. So two years ago, I decided I wanted to apply for a grant on campus and this grant provides funding to units that want to provide some sort of resource to the larger UCSB community. And I decided I want to put on a series of events. I want them to be panels and workshops and mixers, all about thriving in grad school as a low income first gen student. And I wanted undergrads to meet grad students and grad students to provide advice to them. And so I applied for the grant. We got funded. Instead of putting on four events, we got funded to put on uh, two events in one. And it was both a panel and a mixer. And we had six grad students in a panel and then a mixer with uh, about 10 to 12 tables and one grad student per table and undergrads, um, multiple undergrads per table. And the first year went well. We had about 80 people. Um, and then this past year, our numbers nearly doubled, so even better. Um, and it just goes to show you that people want to learn strategies to thrive, to thrive in higher education as an undergrad and grad student. So that's why I wanted to talk more about this today. And what I'm going to do is I am going to be sharing some of the questions. These are discussion questions that we gave during the mixer. I'm going to be answering them myself for you. And if you want, I recommend that you take a notepad and a pen and write down these questions so that you can ask them to the um, academics, the femtors, mentors in your life so that way you get more advice. So like I said, I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to test out my sound and then I'll be back before you know it in a few seconds uh, to get started on the questions. All right. I'll see you in a bit. All right, I'm back. Everything sounds good. So far, so good. Let's see. I'm going to start by providing definitions to three key words that I think are important for you to know if you don't know them already. And I'm going to be mentioning them as I answer my discussion questions. The first key word is imposter syndrome. And this is a term that refers to high achieving individuals who perceive that they are a fraud or that they cannot meet expectations regardless of their experience, skills, or other qualities. 
Imposter syndrome is especially prevalent among first-gen, low-income, and underrepresented students. But anybody can experience it. The next term is microaggressions. This refers to the brief and commonplace, the, the daily verbal, nonverbal, behavioral, or environmental insults, intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based on their marginalized group membership. The third um, and final key term I'm going to highlight today is family achievement guilt. And this refers to the guilt students may feel for having more educational opportunities and college success than their family members. Consequently, students may feel that they have to minimize their academic success when they're around their family members. So just keep these terms in mind because I'm going to go straight to the first two with my first question. So I have four discussion questions. I'm going to be answering three out of the four because the fourth one has uh, more to do with what I was talking about last week with regard to self-care and um, stress management. And so for that, I feel like I've already answered that last week. So we'll, we'll put a hold on that one. Um, first, I'm going to like read aloud the four questions and then I'm going to get into answering them. The first one is, if you want to write this down, how do you deal with imposter syndrome and or microaggressions? Question number two, how do you find advocates or mentors as a first-gen college student? Question number three, what continues to motivate you to pursue your educational goals? And question number four, the one I'm not going to answer, what strategies do you use for self-care, stress management, and community building? This I, meant, I answered last week, so that's why I'm not going to talk about it today. All right, so the first one. How do you deal with imposter syndrome and or microaggressions? We'll start with imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome affects me every day. And it affects me even with recording this podcast because, and it took me a while to even gather the courage to record myself because I kept thinking like, who am I? Why would someone want to listen to me? Um, what do I have to say that's of value? And the more I process that, the more I realize, wait, hold up, hold up. You've been mentoring students since... 2010, you know, I became a graduate student mentor in 2010, helping them for 10 years, helping people get into graduate school, helping people like myself, and I myself got myself into graduate school and graduated, like helping other low-income first-gen representative students do this for so long successfully, and I'm still doubting myself, like, come on now. So how do I battle it when I feel like, oh, I'm not good enough to do this recording. My podcast isn't that great. I don't have information that's that important or that useful. Um, I start th to think about um, all of my achievements and how far I've come and how my voice is worthy, or, you know, how the work that I do is worthy. Or, I mean, you know what some people do. Um, I don't do this that much, but uh, <laughs> I've heard of other women of color who do this. They, they say that they try to behave with like the courage of, um, I don't know, I'm going to totally tear this up because I can never remember sayings properly, but like the courage of a um, very basic white guy who probably doesn't even have a lot of work experience, but like has that um, self-confidence to think that they own the world. Well, yeah, some people do that. They're like, oh, I'm going to have the self-confidence of this like basic white guy. Um, very mediocre white guy um, to do the things that I need to do. Not necessarily what I do. Um, I don't have to think about that to um, think that I'm worthwhile. I, I do often refer back to my um, achievements and how far I've come to feel worthwhile and to do the things to like gain the courage to do the things that I want to do, to not hold myself back. Because oftentimes that's what imposter syndrome does. You feel like you're not good enough. You feel like you're a fraud. You feel like someone's going to catch you and, and realize that you don't know anything. And so you don't put yourself out there. 
All right. The second part of this question is how do you deal with microaggressions? This is harder for me only because I've never really um, known exactly how to handle microaggressions in that moment. I usually do one of two things. More often the first one, every once in a while the last one. The first one is often I stay quiet um, and I try not to respond. I try not to get, and I try not to personalize it um, because usually it's um, an incident where someone who has a certain power dynamic over me, or maybe they're above me in a hierarchy, or maybe I don't want to burn this bridge professionally. So I find that it's easier for me to just remain quiet. Um, I don't always do this though, even when there is that power dynamic. And it, I think it just depends on how much power that person has over me and how much courage I'm feeling that day or maybe how much anger I'm feeling over what they said. But I can talk to you about one instance in particular. Because um, remember, microaggressions, they can be racialized. They can be gendered. They can be maternal. They can be class. Like in any way that you can be oppressed, um, othered, uh, marginalized, then there are microaggressions for that. So for me, I had this one professor who wanted to meet up with me to network and he had no idea that I was a mom. Um, in fact, a lot of people had no idea because I was a young mom or I am a young mom. <laughs> and he said something along the lines, he was complaining about a colleague and saying like, oh, I can't believe she got tenure. How dare she? I mean, she was hardly around, hardly published anything. All she did was spend time with her kids. Ha, I can't believe. How dare they give her tenure? And I felt really insulted um, in that moment. And it was one of those cases where I refused to be silent. And I told him something along the lines. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but probably something along the lines of like, what you said right now is really insulting because I am a mom too. And I hope to one day get tenure and I plan to have more than one child. And I um, would only hope that the other people in my department, especially men, um, that they would support me and that they would congratulate me and celebrate me when I get tenure and not, you know, be talking about me in a condescending manner behind my back. I don't think I said those words verbatim, um, but I said something along those lines where I expressed how insulted I was. So, of course, right away, he was like, no, 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 like, you are taking this wrong. Like, I'm very supportive of parenting students. And I cut the conversation short and the meeting ended. But again, this person was not on my committee. This person was not my advisor. This is just someone I wanted to network with, Not did not have as much power over me. So I felt more comfortable calling this person out. Um, and then, of course, later that day, he emailed me with a long, long memo explaining how supportive he's been of parenting students. Um, and that, you know, he's very sorry if I, if he offended me in any way, that was not his intent. But whatever, the point is, that was a maternal microaggression for me, and I felt the need to call him out. So it's been one of two things, either I remain quiet and then I later on vent to my friends or a therapist or I call them out, call them in and use that as a learning lesson for that individual. It's up to you how much energy you have um, on that day or ever, you know, it, what you decide to do. But definitely um, take care of yourself and find a coping mechanism, whether that's therapy, a friend um, or making it a teachable moment in hopes that that person will change. Um, that's how I've handled them. All right, question number two. Uh, how do you find advocates or mentors as a first-gen college student? This is hard for me because, or this has been hard for me because I self-identify as an introvert. And when I was an undergrad, I... I didn't really go to office hours. I felt intimidated by my professors. They seemed so intelligent and so different for me. I mean, culturally and in so many different ways that I, I didn't reach out enough. And so for me to find advocates and mentors 
over time, I found that my best, my biggest advocates and, and mentors, femtors have been the other women that I've surrounded myself with. So I surrounded myself with these really fierce, powerful women of color, mothers of color that motivate me every day. Um, I follow them on social media. I love their posts. They inspire me. And so for me, it's been like surrounding myself with people that I want to be like, with people that um, make me want to be better. And then also like referring to them, referring to my friends and my uh, community for referrals, uh, for like, who are they working with? Who has femtored, mentored them? And, and that's what's helped me. And I, I must admit, like, I, I still continue to struggle with finding femtors. Um, I'm more comfortable with like my group of peers. Um, but among my group of peers, I've seen who they've uh, worked with and who they've surrounded themselves with. And, and that's helped me um, to gain the courage to reach out. So definitely rely on your friends, on your com community uh, to find advocates because you can't do this on your own. All right. The next question is what continues to motivate you to pursue your educational goals? And so for this, I'm going to go back to thinking about my undergrad and my grad school days to let you know, hopefully, you know, what I can remember about what motivated me then. In undergrad, I, my biggest motivator was my passion for theater. I did theater from elementary school through my junior year of undergrad and mostly acting. And I also did some stage managing and I found theater to be this incredibly powerful venue for me. And I get pr promoted um, empowerment, social change. It was just this space where anything could happen. And, um, that was just so healing for me to have that space. And I knew that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so what motivated me to go to graduate school was like, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep studying this. I want to keep practicing this. And what better way than to go off and get a PhD in theater. And that was my, that was my, my biggest motivation was just passion, having a passion for a practice and a type of study. And that's what kept me going. Then in grad school, you know, you change as, as time goes on, you change, you develop. Um, and I noticed that my passion for theater was dissipating. It was like slowly kind of going away. And I think part of it had to do with some of the toxicity of graduate school. The fact that I, you know, was discouraged from practicing theater, was all about studying critical theory, all about, um, researching and publishing that that initial connection that I had to the practice and to the community was lost I felt disconnected from the theater community disconnected from my community of like Latinx students and so because of that I lost that passion and don't get me wrong I still to this day absolutely love theater um, I get butterflies in my stomach I get the jitters I I just I overanalyze shows. I absolutely adore theater. I think that one day when my kids get older, I will likely go back to practicing theater. This is just not the right time for me. But in graduate school, you know, that, that motivation that I initially had in undergrad was lost. And I found a different kind of motivator. And for me, it was... It was working with students. So mentoring, femtoring was a big motivator. It was surrounding myself with support systems um, and like-minded people that kept me going. And then I was also doing this for myself because I realized that getting a PhD provided me with a sense of consciousness, um, uh, paradigm shifting. Um, this is like this feeling of understanding where I am in the world, um, understanding my identity at such a deep level that no one could take that from me no matter what would happen no matter what career I would pursue regardless of if I was working in an institution of higher education or not 
I would forever be a scholar. I would forever think critically. I would forever understand myself in the world. Um, and I didn't, you know, I needed to finish that. I needed to complete the PhD. Um, it was a personal goal for me. I mean, I also have this model that I've had for a long time where I just say failure is not an option. And so no matter how many hurdles I went through, I didn't see it as, as an option for me to just give up. And so that's what kept motivating me. And I think that, I guess in short, unfortunately, this episode of re-recording is shorter than my previous one. It is what it is. But the main idea I want to get across to you in terms of thriving as a low-income person or URM student in grad school is that you've got to learn to like fight, combat that imposter syndrome. Learn to manage those microaggressions. Like find out how to cope, you know, with that. Find advocates, find femtors and mentors who are going to fight for you and learn to fight for yourself too. Um, implement the self-care, the stress management, the community building, the su support system building. And keep reminding yourself of what motivates you to keep, to keep going, to pursue these educational goals. Because I don't want to send people off to graduate school to barely survive and to kill themselves along their, the way to get sick doing this. I want to send you off to thrive, to do make the most of this opportunity to do your best and not kill yourself while doing it to do your best and still be be well to 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 do it while you're healing um and i hope that some of this advice is useful to you again ask these questions to the people around you see you know find out what strategies do they use because i don't know everything um, hopefully some of what I said will help you and hopefully you'll kind of reach out to others and you'll get even more advice because I want you all to, to be your best selves. All right. That is all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening with me. And, um, if any of this resonated with you, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me in the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please rate this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere else where you tune in. You can also contact me with your questions and episode topics by sending me a voice message on Anchor, sending me a message via my website at yvettemartinezvu.com, or emailing me at yvettemtz3 at gmail.com. Until next time.